welcome to the Writer's Block, episode 10, Origin Stories, brought to you by Throwbacks, the e-cigarette you light with a match. I am Rylan Grant, screenwriter, Ringo award-winning creator of fine comics like Aberrant, Banjax, and The Jump. The other voice in the dark, the man in the box to the left is... David Avalone, comic book writer, film person, and general layabout. General layabout. You know, I, I, I said... Ma- I said man to the left again. I think you're to the right this time. So uh, I, uh, you have been on the left of me like the last four times. I, I, I feel like you juke me. You know what I'm saying? You get me used a to little one bit, thing. And then, bit. We yeah. jump around. We jump around a little bit. But uh, you, today yeah. we have a great show. Shall we bring in our guests? Uh, give me one second. I mean, if you missed our last episode, the playing with other oh, yeah. people's toys discussion with uh, with Batgirl scribe Cecil Castellucci and Superman of Metropolis writer Sean Lewis, I strongly suggest you back it on up and check that out. Uh, but as Evelyn was alluding to, great show today, incredible show. Uh, let's bring him on. Okay, Chris Cantwell, ladies and gentlemen, and Ashley and Jason. <laughs> Hello. Great Chris, ways, tell us guys. about yourself. Me? Yes, you. Uh, you first. I'm a Scorpio. Uh, <laughs> I write, like long I walks on the so what's your moon and rising? These are the important questions. Oh, shoot. You know what? Someone told me this recently, and it was like, apparently my, it felt much more accurate than like what I've been told about Scorpio. Scorpio makes sense for me, but it's mm-hmm. not like... It's whatever, but I, I've, I I haven't had my chart done. I actually have a cousin who's a, a astrologist. Um, I should have her do my full chart, but I, I don't know. But do you know your moons? I'm a, I'm, I'm a triple Aries, so I'm an Aries <laughs> sun, moon, and rising, uh, wow. which means I like to cry and I like to argue. <laughs> How do you find out what your moon what your moons are? Uh, if you're lazy like me, you'll go to cafeastrology.com and you type in your birth date and location and it'll come up and it'll give you a basic breakdown. Uh, if you are more invested, then you'll get your best friend who's very into it to explain it to you in slightly more depth. <laughs> okay. This well, wait, episode um, brought to you by I, Cafe Astrology. Thank you. I, know, I, just, I just went to it. I just went to it, but I don't know where to enter that in. Well, I'll do that later. <laughs> later in the podcast, uh, because I well, no, I, I I want to hear about your moons before the end of this thing. So, <laughs> so while someone else is, uh, you're, 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 we'll yeah, you're we'll introing yourself now. But while someone else is talking, try and uh, well, yeah, your, your try, moon try is how you see yourself. So actually, your sun and your rising would be more impactful. Okay, well, you have to tell me where the link is. Uh, you said tangents were acceptable, so I started. Absolutely, I'm loving it. Totally uh, I write Iron Man for Marvel Comics. Uh, which used to be known as Timely Comics <laughs> uh, and Atlas Comics. Is that What's right? What's their moon? What Marvel <laughs> here? I don't know. Marvel's definitely an Aries or a Leo vibe. Very showy, yep. Very but showy. not dedicated. Yeah, Leo, Leo is right. um, and I also, uh, I write Dr. Doom, which is finishing up next month in December. Um, and I've got a couple uh, creator-owned books that I've done with Burger Books. Um, and I'll have some other stuff coming out in 2021. And, 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 and in, 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 in the other part of my life, I'm a, a TV showrunner, uh, created Halt and Catch Fire for AMC. And right now, um, show running Paper Girls for Amazon with my partner, Chris Rogers and my new partner, Steph Folsom, who co-wrote Toy Story 4. Nice. There it is. Very nice. Hi, Actually. I'm <laughs> Ashley Victoria Robinson. I'm a triple Aries. Uh, <laughs> I am an actor writer. If you have Urban Flicks TV, please watch the finale episode of Pump. Watch me snort fake cocaine. My mom is very proud of me. Uh, nice. If you are using Twitter's marketing service, please notice my face and how marketable it makes it seem as you watch the commercials that play at the top of that page. I also co-write Jupiter Jet. Our volume two just came out, Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio, and Science, the Elements of Dark Energy uh, with the lovely gentleman to my left, but maybe you're right if you're watching this. I'm very bad at space the time. Uh, and they are nominated <laughs> for Ringo Awards, but we are not as cool as Ryland. We keep losing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh i'll jump in with not quite a wwe introduction like ryland i wish i could have done it but I, I when you started i was like do we all have to come in like sunday 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 uh, <laughs> comics comics that's a, comics yeah. that's a uh, uh but i'm a kansas farm boy turned veteran turned comic book writer with this lovely lady uh we mainly do comic books on kickstarter we've been ringo nominated and uh my regular 
day job is I'm a showrunner's assistant on a CBS television show that's buried under so many NDAs that I haven't been able to talk about it for over a year. Wow. <laughs> Jeez. That's yeah. impressive. But yep. For for the record, I, I've lost six times at the Ringo, so I'm, uh, I'm uh, <laughs> okay. So we I'm, have. I'm, I'm well versed in that. Yeah. Four more go rounds before. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, the topic we were going to talk about today, we want to kick off the show talking about uh, secret origins. Um, comic book characters have them, and so do comic book creators. And uh, you know, over your life, there's a moment or a series of moments of inspirations or influences that make you decide to do this crazy shit with your life. Uh, and we want to talk about like, what were those moments for you? What set you down the path of being a storyteller? Okay. Uh, who wants to go? Who wants to go uh, you, you've already started. So take the ball. <laughs> My story begins. Uh, <laughs> On a dark and stormy night. The short, the short grass in Texas. Uh, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I guess I don't know. Mike. I had a great uncle Jim who was a really good storyteller in the family, and that was it. Like he could just like keep everybody going around the table, and uh, it was very funny and just could kind of lay out those oral stories in such a great way. And then it was funny. He tried to write a book when he was older, and he, you know, type on a typewriter and everything. <laughs> And it was terrible. It was like, <laughs> income, it was like, you couldn't even, it didn't make any sense. And I was like, well, I was like, I want to do both those things. That seems kind of cool. And like, so when my uncle Jim tried to do that, I think I, I, I discovered, you know, writing and then specifically screenwriting um, in high school, you know, it was a, a board summer, I think before I had a car and I was like, I'll go get, I went and got like the screenwriters Bible from Barnes and Noble that, you know, taught you how to at least construct a screenplay. And then, and then from there went to USC film school in the screenwriting program. Uh, I was waitlisted. So I was really pissed off at the beginning, but look at me now. I, uh, look at me I, now. Uh, I, I, I got rejected from AFI uh, the first go round and, uh, and NYU. Uh, and then I was waitlisted at AFI the second year and then finally got in like last minute. So I'm, I'm right there with you. Yeah, exactly. And it, so I, yeah, I remember I wrote, I think I wrote a personal letter to the chair of the department, you know, from an 18 year old kid being like, please. Um, and I got in. <laughs> and then, you know, then it was like eight years of random whatever was happening. Um, I almost joined the circus. Uh, <laughs> what would have been almost, your skill? Huh? What would you, what would have been your speciality in the circus? I studied, I studied clowning with a 75 year old master clown in South Maine. Nice. Wow. In a barn. So <laughs> this is a, you're, this is a, like, I thought you, I thought it was a joke. Like you, you seriously almost joined the circus. Yeah. It was a, wow. it, was a it was a regional circus guys. It was like a div three school. It was like the minor league circus. Yeah, yes. Wow. <laughs> it was like, well, you're going to be aroused about from about Washington through Oregon down to Southern California. We do a show in San Diego that wraps up the year. Uh, <laughs> and I, I kind of backed out of that. I almost joined the Coast Guard. Um, and then, yeah, I was like doing commercial coordinating and then was doing some like short films, putting them up on YouTube, ended up working at a startup when video was kind of the first big thing in social that got acquired by Disney. And then by 20. 2008, I was like a, a creative director at the Walt Disney Company in marketing. Um, and by that point, I was like, okay, I don't think I'm going to be writing anything anytime soon. But I met a, my, the guy I met at my company was Chris Rogers, who I created Halt and Catch Fire with. Um, I actually hired him because um, he had just got let go by Condé Nast. And so the two of us started writing. And we did one pilot, and they say, write a second one so we can have two samples to try to staff you guys. And the second one we wrote was Halt and Catch Fire. So as good fortune would have it, it's just like that was right at the right time where there was basically just HBO Showtime AMC doing that kind of stuff and, and AMC wanted it. So it was this crazy thing. All of a sudden we, we were, we were paid writers. So, so yeah. And then I did that for several years and obviously I'm still doing that. And um, <laughs> I hooked up um, online with Karen Berger through Willow Wilson who introduced me when I had like an idea for a comic book and then ended up working with Karen Berger and kind of worked my way into y'all's community as mm. an imposter. <laughs> That's where I am now. In, 
in the small world department, I remember, I can't remember how many years ago now you would probably have a tighter beat on it than I do, but I was having coffee with a good friend of mine who is an underrated, excellent actor and the funniest person in the entire universe. And he was either on his way to or had just come from an audition for a thing about Texas computers. Uh, oh, sorry. Toby. I was having oh coffee God, with, Toby you first heard with Toby. Yeah, that's and that's the, first, that's the first time I heard the title of your show. It was like I'm doing this thing. It's a. He's like, I think I, I think it was a good audition. I, I went a different way than I think they were expecting me to go. And you definitely did. Uh, you definitely did. Yeah. <laughs> I remember watching it. I was my I was casting my first casting session. I was like, because we wrote that character to be super grounded and like super Texan and like have a low center of gravity. And then, like, we couldn't keep Toby in the frame with the casting camera. Like, he was moving around so much. Yeah. And he left. And I remember turning to Chris and being like, what the fuck was that? Like, that was <laughs> And our director of the pilot, Juan Campanella, turned around and said, um, you have to cast that guy immediately. He could win an Emmy for this part. And we were like, okay. And he, writing for Toby was so much fun. Yeah. Such an awesome guy, too. Yeah. yeah no, it, it was, it was so, yeah. I was a fan for years and years and years and and met him after he did used to do this live show called uh, Rudy Cassoni. It's kind of a Sinatra I've, thing. I've I'm seen sure. it. Yes, that's all the Christmas yeah. one. The very funny pastiche of late career bitter hates everyone Sinatra and it's genius. And he's been doing it really? since <laughs> MTV it's in the late eighties. Yes. Uh, and, I, I, uh, I bought I bought so much Toby stock, uh, uh, you know, back in the in the late '80s, early '90s when he did all those MTV uh, bits. I mean, I, I just, I, I mean, I, I still play them. I mean, I, I was you and I were were trading them uh, a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, he was uh, arguably yeah, the strongest man in the world on Pete and Pete too. That was the first. Yeah, that was the first thing. So yeah, I saw him at a uh, Rudy Cassoni show, and we became friends and Amazing. all that over the years. But he's yeah, he's just a terrific guy, and uh, it's a. It, I just feel I, I'm impressed with anyone who's smart enough to cast Toby Huss in a dramatic role because he, as I said, he's the funniest man in the world, but terrific dramatic actor. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I mean, I credit Juan for that. And, and then it was such a gift to have him. It was like we got an ensemble show with a fifth member because, I mean, I didn't know how long that character is going to last. He was supposed right. to be like kind of an antagonist. And then with Toby, it was like, well, let's just write, let's, let's keep him around forever. And it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, sorry for the yet another uh, uh, distraction, but uh, I love the guy, and it's just you know, it's uh, it's just funny those moments where it's like he had. I think he had just come from the audition, and it was just like, yeah, whatever. I get, I get it. I don't get it, and then you know, however many seasons later, Ashley, tell us oh, about your origin story. I was not alive in the '80s, nor was I raised in the United States, so I don't have references anyone's going to understand. Sorry. <laughs> okay, they have Google. <laughs> just, just drop red green. We were all alive in the nineties. We were, we were in the two thousand. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyone seen red green? That's that's all I got uh, from Canada. That was when I met Jason. He knew who red green was, and I was like, I can't believe an American knows what that is. As I didn't have cable, <laughs> I only had PBS. <laughs> um, so for me, the big thing, usually people ask how I got into comic books and my answer for that is not good. So I'm glad we're just doing general storytelling. The answer is much more general. interesting. Yeah. Um, the big thing for me was so weird tangent. My family's all, uh, athletes, either like Olympic or international level athletes, my immediate family. So I was a competitive swimmer and a triathlete. That was my childhood was a lot of getting up early and running about and then wow. I saw the Lord of the Rings and I read that Elijah Wood was 19 when he started filming. And I was like, I, I could do that. That sounds great. <laughs> no problem. Not understanding that he'd been in the industry since he was probably a baby. I, d I didn't know that he was the kid from Flipper or anything like that, like had established so many relationships to get him to that point in the first place. Uh, and I, for my high school career, lived in a place called Stratford in Ontario, Canada. And Stratford nice. has the largest professional Shakespeare festival outside of London. It's named after the town where Shakespeare was born. It's got a river, it's the Avon River, all of that. And I was like, well, I wanna be an actor. And my mom was like, so go act, good luck. <laughs> and uh, what's simple. very fortunate is that there's a ton of professional work there and there's a ton of amateur. So all of my like early storytelling was 
Shakespeare. The first play I ever did was yeah. Hamlet. I was probably a very poor Rosencrantz, but when you get to, <laughs> it was truly still one of my happiest memories. Um, yes. but probably not very funny. I, I, remember, I, I, grew, I remember Tom Stoppard's uh, sequel, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, are cute, which is a <laughs> very good play. I, 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 I grew up in Detroit, so we would do a uh, every year we'd do a field trip uh, to at school to, Sh to Stratford. Yeah, oh, nice. and I mean I, I spent a lot of time in Windsor in general. You know, I mean, uh, you know, later it was casinos and uh, um, drinking two years early. Uh, I was gonna say uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but 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 when I was a kid, yeah, it was Stratford and uh, you know the Outer Banks and you know all, all that stuff. So a uh, uh, great town. Yeah. That's how did you make school. the transition from uh, Shakespeare to writing your own stuff? What was the... uh, so I went to a performing arts magnet high school uh, because, of course, and we had a really great theater community and I was in the theater stream. So like I wrote the first thing that I ever wrote that was like not fan fiction alone in my bedroom, uh, which hopefully someone has burned those, was a play. I think it was called Lack and it was about a deaf girl and all of her emotions were personified and then she got hit by a car at the end. So that gives you a sense of what I was like as a teenager. Uh, I think and, that's what everybody's like as a teenager. I, you know, I think we we're, yeah. we're all hitting people with it, cars. It is such our... a, I will say as Ashley's husband, it is such a singular definition of Ashley. That... <laughs> <laughs> like as soon as you're like, oh yeah, that's you. Uh, and, then... and I mean that with love, no offense, <laughs> yeah, yeah. not offense. Obviously. Uh, and then I did I did a lot of <laughs> I did a lot of plays for a really long time. If someone goes back through some of those old anthologies, they were definitely published. Like no publisher told me no until I got to comics and they were like, we don't want this. <laughs> and then I moved to the States um, to go to theater school. And when all the other international students moved back at the end of term, I was like, but we're already here. Why would you leave? This is where we all want to be. And so I have spent now my entire adult life and about $30,000 becoming an American citizen. And that's mm -hmm. how I became a storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> welcome. Uh, we, we welcome your citizenship. Thank you. Uh, Jason. Uh, so I grew up in a small town that I tell everybody in Hollywood that is Smallville. But it's people actually, think it's real. Uh, <laughs> people do think it's a real place. It's not. Uh, I grew up in a town called, around, actually outside the town called Stark, Kansas. It has a population of less than 73 people right now. But it is three hours from the closest airport in every direction. Um, it, which makes going home very expensive. I have to rent a rental car every single time. But um, I grew up in there, and that's where I got like a lot of love of deep science fiction. And I always like would write. And my original goal was to draw comics. And I was planning to join the Joe Kubert School. And I remember my junior or sophomore year of high school looking at an issue of like Adam Kubert's Wolverine and then looking at my stuff and being like, oh boy, this is never going to happen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and this crushing my dreams completely. Um, and it wasn't until a couple years later that I was like, oh, well, I could write and I could draw. And that led me to um, writing while I was in college. And while I was in college, I, I, I joined the Army National Guard. Um, and when I was in the Kansas Army National Guard, we got the word that they were going to send us overseas to Iraq. And so that's when I upped into the regular Army. And I spent the entire year of 2005 in Iraq. And it was, it was a very interesting experience in my life because at that time I'd been out of comic books. And... I got sent a comic book in a care package. What issue was it? Um, it was two. It was, I don't remember the exact numbers. It was an issue of Adventures of Superman, and it was an Ultimate X-Men. And the Ultimate X-Men stands out the most because it was an Ultimate X-Men issue where they made, Mark Miller made Nightcrawler an assassin. And I remember reading that being like, what the hell? This is not my Nightcrawler. And that sort of brought me back into comic books and is also the inspiration for why I do the job and charity drive for service members every year. So come back from there finish up college, I write some more, I come out to LA with the goal of being in a television writer's room, and then I very quickly get into the YouTube world, and I work for companies like Mahalo, um, I helped Rhett and Link create Good Mythical Morning, uh, that show, like I produced and wrote the first 400 episodes, I ended up doing Screen Junkies and, and uh, working in Honest Trailers and doing stuff over there, and then a contest comes up for DC Comics where they're looking for a new host. I wasn't going to enter it uh, because I thought there was no chance in hell. Ashley convinced me to enter it. And I become the host of DC All Access for DC Comics for the next three years. Um, 
And all during that, it was it was DCL Access that finally, I was talking to all these creators and being like, yeah, we can make a comic book. We can do this. <laughs> like, talking to them, it's not difficult. Like, it's very easy. And then that... Tr- not easy. Not true. <laughs> well, sure. But it, it, it was the first time that it seemed like it was doable. Because right. I, I was, like, getting behind the scenes information from all these, like, Brian Hitch and, and, and Tom King and Scott Snyder and, like, all these huge names and being like, yeah, everything they're talking about, I can do easily. Yeah, let's do this. Um, and, and eventually we were talking about different ideas, and that led to... Ashley one time shouting out Jupiter Jet, and that's where Jupiter Jet came from. Um, and then, you know, in the course of that, I've been writing pilots on the side and doing things, but couldn't figure out how to get into television until a good friend of mine, Josh Hale Fialkoff, called me up one day and said, Hey, I'm on this military show. Can I pick your brain? And my first response to that question was, Are they hiring? <laughs> and I became the showrunner's assistant on CBS is the code and the showrunner liked me so much that he's kept me on this new show and nice. uh, I've been there ever since. I think the 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 first question to the first question after every uh opening like that in Los Angeles is what would a thing like that pay? <laughs> <laughs> you know, especially when someone is trying to to milk you for free work. It's like, can I? Sure. What What does that pay? What is a thing like that? Just out of Let curiosity. Let me tell you, assistants don't get paid enough. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, of course not. It's, uh... But I will say, I will say, like, I didn't, with, with Josh, I already, I already owed him because a couple years earlier, I had had like a six month period where I was completely unemployed. And I, I liked a lot of his comic books and stuff like that. And I literally sent him a blind email saying, I'm unemployed. You don't have to pay me. Can I be your assistant? Just because I want to learn from you. And and luckily, his response was, I can't not pay you. But sure. <laughs> That's amazing. Hey, what, what you were in the Kansas National Guard, Army National Guard? Yeah. From from how many how many years? Uh, from, I was from in when there from when? six years, from like 2000 to 2006. Do you know, did you know um, Major Gen- uh, Jeremy Clausen? I did not. He was a, a really good friend of mine from um, Kansas National Guard. And he ended up, he went to Afghanistan as a 46 Romeo journalist and then uh, oh, wow. uh, came back and then went full infantry and did the ranger school and everything. And then went back, I think, to Iraq twice. Yeah. My that, unit, my unit went another three times after I got out of wow. it. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. Wild stuff, Ryland. What about you? What was your uh, so, what was your inspiration? So I'm up, yeah, and you know, and I was the uh, I was the guy who came up with this uh, this I don't know harebrained idea for a for a show here. Um, you know, this popped into my mind when I was watching my four year old daughter play with her toys. Um, you know, she's uh, she's entered this period of her life where she's really interested in television shows and how characters sort of develop over time and how, um, you know, things set up and pay off in TV shows. And she's starting to act it out with her toys, um, <laughs> which I think is just so beautiful and interesting to watch. And it um, was maybe the first time that I guess my journey, um, you know, uh, as a writer kind of fully came into focus, um, you know, w- w- without, you know, telling too much of a, a sob story here, um, I had a pretty shitty childhood for a while. I mean, I grew up in a housing project in Detroit. um, And, uh, you know, it was it was a rough go. You know, if I went outside, I got the shit kicked out of me by 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 a lot of people. Uh, And as a result, I didn't spend a lot of time out there didn't spend a lot of time with uh, the kids around me. And so I spent a lot of time at home, uh, uh, glued to the television uh, and playing with my toys. and, um, you know, my parents were not always the best role models. Um, and so the television raised me, you know, uh, uh, I learned right and wrong from Captain Picard. Um, you know, I learned my personality from Johnny Fever and Sam Malone, you know, uh, uh, you know, th- these were almost bigger influences on me, at least in a, you know, in a positive sense than a lot of the adults uh, around me at the time. Um, and, you know, the greatest stories that I ever told, I told with my toys when I was a kid. 
Um, you know, I would, uh, I mean, I, you know, watch hundreds of episodes of, of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles over and over and over again. And then I would stage an entire episode with all the toys, you know? Um, and it's, it's no, uh, it's no coincidence that I now write in just an office full of toys. I mean, these are, and in fact, most of these are the exact toys that, um, that I played with when I was a kid. Um, this is this is great radio right now for the people listening on, uh, on Spotify. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 if you can't see it, I am uh, I am turning uh, my my camera around so uh, you know everyone can kind of see the you know what is probably now thousands of toys in, in my office, and I just scared the shit out of everybody. I I, I think so. Uh, um, no, you look so, at our place. No, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. we're all we're all toy, toy people. Like, yeah. cool. this is great podcasting. We're all showing our collections. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. God. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, so uh, you know, it's um, I, I just never stopped doing that. You know, I mean, I still have the toys. I still play with them a little bit too much. Um, they still inspire all this creativity uh, in me, and so. I sit in this cave now and I write surrounded by all of this stuff that inspired me as a, a kid and got me through it. It, it is a weird uh, psychological onion that uh, we probably shouldn't peel back uh, uh, you know, too, too many of the layers of. Um, I think it's but, a wonderful you know, coping mechanism. You could have clearly <laughs> done so much worse. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I mean, you it, could have just shown us your collection of knives. I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. And, and, yeah, yeah, and, and believe me, you know, I mean, you, you grow, you, you know, you grow up in a place like that, and um, and you know, a lot of people cope in very terrible ways. You know, I mean, the the people I grew up with, they did not break, uh, uh, you know, well uh, in a lot of cases. You know, um, you know, I would say there were, um, you know, there were eight people that I was pretty close to growing up in that same complex that you know they all got, you know, they all had their heroin wrestling matches, and a lot of them didn't make it out of the head and. And, um, you know, it was, it, it was, it was just a place that you didn't get out of, uh, uh, too often. You know, most of the people that I grew up with, they're still right back there, you know, five minutes away from where they were born. And not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but it just wasn't for me. Like I needed a way out of it. And, um, and, you know, I came, um, I did a lot of, uh, I did a lot of political work growing up. My, my dad had me standing on a, a corner with a sandwich board. Uh, 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 for a for a presidential candidate, I, I won't say which uh, uh, now because I don't want this to turn into a political discussion. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, uh, but um, so I, I was ten years old, and my dad had me doing you know uh, uh, campaigning work, and I did something for every major and local election until I graduated high school, and I had named positions on Senate campaigns, and went into high schools, and uh, and spoke to groups of kids, and uh, and you know uh, registered eighteen year olds to vote. And, um, and I was, uh, I was, you know, going to be a political operative. That's what I was going to do. Um, I, I was sort of groomed to do that from the time I was 10. Um, <clears throat> and so as a result, I came like in, in, to within an inch of going to the Naval Academy. I had a congressional appointment, um, and was sort of on the eve of accepting it. And, um, and then a, uh, uh, a, a scholarship offer came from the University of Michigan. Um, and it was my dad who was a, um, uh, a Vietnam veteran, uh, who talked me how to go into the Naval Academy. Um, and you know, basically he said, look, if you, you know, if you still want to go into the military, you know, there, there are plenty of options, uh, at U of M after U of M. Um, uh, but if you go to U of M, there are all these other options, uh, open for you. <clears throat> and so I ended up accepting the scholarship to the university of Michigan and, um, and, you know, I got there and I studied political science like I was supposed to um, for, you know, the better part of the year. And I was just miserable. I mean, and, 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 and it was sort of, you know, it coincided with, I mean, politics have always been ugly. But at that point, politics were really starting to become this like ugly black and white contradictory quagmire uh, that, you know, sort of resulted in all this fucking shit that we're dealing with now. I was just really sad all the time, just just fucking miserable. And um, and, you know, we're, we're sort of on the eve of another semester starting and I'm registered for three poli sci classes and, and something else that was going to make me miserable. And <laughs> I basically, basically have like the mother of all college nervous breakdowns. Um, and I do the cliche of like walking around campus all night um, and trying to think of what on earth is going to make me happy because this is not going to make me happy. Like something really bad is going to happen if I keep walking this path. And, um, 
I'm going to date myself a bit by walking at 7 a.m. the moment that our telephone registration system opens up. And uh, I drop all of my classes for, for the coming semester. The semester is starting the next day. I drop everything. I'm registered for no classes uh, about you know, 24 hours before the semester starts. And I pick up a course guide and I start flipping through. And I'm like, what the fuck is going to make me uh, uh, happy? And I register for, um, for two film classes, an environmental science class, and an art history class. And um, you know, a couple of years later, I graduated with a, a triple major in, uh, in film, theater, and art history. Um, and it was a weird thing, you know? I mean, TV, storytelling, it was, it was my passion from the time that I, can, that I could start actually forming ideas, right? Um, and, you know, I came up during the Sundance movement. Like, I saw Pulp Fiction, and I'm like, oh, my God this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. I would love to do this. And then I saw clerk sometime after that. And I started to think like, okay, well maybe, maybe this is doable. Right. Um, you know, because I mean, here's a guy who, I mean, he lived in, in some tiny town in New Jersey and, you know, he put a film on his credit cards. Right. Um, but it, it kind of wasn't until sort of later in high school and then early in college that, um, you know, people where I grew up, you know, they didn't become filmmakers. That wasn't a, it wasn't a possibility. Right. Um, it just, it just wasn't remotely in the cards. And then I got to U of M and my world got a little bit bigger and it's like, wait a minute, people actually study film and Lawrence Kasdan made here, uh, went here, who was like, who's this huge filmmaker. And he went to the University of Michigan and studied this stuff. And then he went and made films. Oh my God. And then it was summer after my, I guess summer after my freshman year, uh, I I won this internship with Oliver Stone and did a whole summer with him. Uh, I was basically like right next to him, prepping any given Sunday, uh, you know, hanging out with LL Cool J and Puff Daddy for a little bit before uh, before Jamie Foxx replaced him and and uh, Elizabeth Berkeley, which was like you know uh, my my all time crush growing up and and um, and my world just got kind of bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I was in New York the next summer and. Uh, I was interning for Martin Scorsese and Hal Hartley at the same time, uh, and my world got a little bit bigger. And um, you know, it just it just kind of kept happening. And then um, and then you know, like I said, uh, ended up at the American Film Institute, where where you know David Lynch went and Aronofsky went, and and you know, my world got a little bit bigger. And um, it was about halfway through my time at AFI, I uh, I won the final draft Big Break competition. Um, and, um, it was a weird thing because, so, you know, I had the scripts that was called drive. It's not the drive that everybody knows. This was the drive before drive. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and the script had been around for a year or two kind of making rounds and, um, and people are like, Oh, you know, great writing sample. Uh, uh, but you know, nobody in Hollywood wants to be the first to say something's good. Right. And then suddenly I win this screenwriting competition and, uh, and then overnight, everybody is fucking on this bandwagon on this thing. People who have read the script like two or three times before they're getting a hold of it now being like, Oh my God, this is amazing. Like uh, the changes you made to this so much better. I don't know what she did to it, but like, but it's night and day. I, I hadn't changed a comma. Right. Um, uh, but suddenly, you know, this was a big deal. And then, and then I'm, I, I'm repped at CAA and then, uh, taking meetings everywhere. Um, and, uh, the, I, I guess about a month after that, um, Penelope Cruz hired me to uh, to write a uh, a script with uh, Fernando Treva, who um, uh, had won the Oscar a few years previously with uh, Bella Polk for foreign language film. Um, and then I was kind of off and running, you know. About halfway through AFI, I, I, I got my first kind of paid writing gig, and um, and thankfully, by some miracle, um, I haven't had to do anything but but write for you know the last fifteen years. And you know, since then, I've written for you know. J.J. Abrams and Ridley Scott and F. Gary Gray and Justin Lin and John Woo and Luke Besson, like, you know, my, my heroes, basically. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the comics of it all, you know, later. But, um, but now I'm writing comics. And it's fucking awesome. Yeah. It's, Give it to I us. Think it, it's, a, it's a great point about uh, playing with toys being the first sort of narrative work that you do, playing with the... Uh, I predate the, the term action figures. When you were a kid, you had Barbies and G.I. Joes. 
G.I. Joe's were just anything that wasn't a Barbie, basically. And when Star Wars action figures came out, they were like, well, those they're not G.I. Joe's. We have to come up with a word for them. And I think that's where action figure comes from. But uh, toys and toy soldiers and all that kind of thing are definitely the spark of telling stories to yourself when you're alone as a kid and occupying your time. Uh, what you said about you know, knowing that people can do it. I'm lucky to a degree. Uh, my father was a professional novelist for almost his entire adult life after he got out of the army in World War II, though he went to work in a stationery store uh, for a long time while he was still churning out, uh, churning out uh, detective novels in the 50s. Uh, I say, you know, lucky as a, because I saw the ups and downs of the freelancer thing. Uh, he loved his work. His work was a joy, an endless joy to him. He actually wrote over 200 published novels. Wow. But we were frequently broke. Uh, the, the, you know, you can have, you can, you can sell 3 million copies of something one year and then the next year have nothing. And so I kind of was, you know, I learned that <laughs> at an early age. Uh, and you talk about being raised by media. I wasn't raised by media, but my father had 17 brothers and sisters wow. in depression era, New York. And as you can imagine, imagine, you know, a withholding parent to begin with, then imagine those withholding parents having to split their love 17 ways. And you begin to understand the neglect <laughs> that my father grew up with. And he was, I learned when I was a kid because of how he was raising me, he was raised by Frank Capra. He was raised by Gary Cooper. He was raised by Jimmy Stewart and Henry Fonda and all of that. And uh, the, the, the bad news about being raised by Frank Capra is you, you, you end up with maybe a more helpful view of humanity than the one we're all stuck with here in reality which uh, bit him in the ass a few times. But all of that about my father one side. Um, I never imagined I would be a novelist because that was his deal. But when I was five, he actually made me stay home from uh, kindergarten or whatever it was, maybe it was six, uh, to watch King Kong when it was shown for the first time on WOR in New York. And of course, I'm talking about 1933 King Kong. This is pre any, you know, any of the English language remakes. And uh, it's a funny thing, but I think people underestimate the power of the fact that the main character in that is a filmmaker. And uh, one of my favorite things in any movie ever, and it, I think it's a moment that changed my life, is when he recruits Fay Ray to go on his psycho trip into the South Seas to go monster hunting and make a movie. Very importantly, we're making a movie about whatever this thing we're going to find on the island is. She says to him, uh, you know, I don't understand what's it all about. And he jumps up out of his seat and says, it's adventure and excitement and a long sea voyage. It starts tomorrow morning at dawn. And who doesn't want to be that guy? Who doesn't want to be the guy that can't stay in his seat because he's so goddamn excited about what he's doing tomorrow morning? We're getting on a boat and we're going to Sumatra and we're, you know, we're, we're, we're chasing a monster and I make my Beauty and the Beast movie and all that. And I think that joy in doing creative work and the idea that human beings did it. It wasn't like elves in factories make art. People do it and you can do it and all of that. And uh, my path to any kind of limited success with it, all you have to do is look at my IMDB page, uh, which resembles the ravings of a maniac just from the many, many job I was a grip for four or five years. I was an assistant director for a long time. I produced a few movies. I directed a karate movie in 1997 <laughs> uh, called Kick of Death, by the way. It's one of the worst movies ever made. What I, Incredible. Lloyd Kaufman, Trauma it's a title, Piccolo. Though. It's a great title. It's a good title. Uh, in, uh, in Patata Mortal, in the very important Latin American market. Is it um, streaming? Yeah. It, it is on <laughs> YouTube. And... Troma picked it up. Wow. What, 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 did, what did Lloyd Kaufman pay you for it? Oh, no, I didn't own it. So, it was, you know, I was okay. actually, a, it was, a, I was cutting, 
it was a it was a movie being made by Silver Lake International Pictures. And uh, if you want to know how fly by night Silver Lake International Pictures are, they were based in Tarzana. Uh, <laughs> not Silver Lake. They lost their lost their rent in Silver Lake and had to move to Tarzana. But Lloyd somehow got the a copy of the movie pre the sound mix. So what's on YouTube is literally <laughs> like the blank firing pistols on the set. Made, there's no sound effects. There's no score. And I've it's been like trying to get a screener. him. It's really, it's really. But what I will say that I love about Lloyd Kaufman is the first time we had a conversation, I met him a bunch of times. But the first time I said to him, you know, you picked up my karate movie, Kick of Death, without a pause. And it's the without a pause that makes him a Stan Lee kind of genius. He said, Kick of Death is the greatest motion picture ever made. <laughs> <laughs> like he didn't put, I just said uh, you have my movie Kick of Death Kick of Death is the greatest motion picture ever made well thank you Lloyd So, but anyway all of that uh, meandering uh, in 2014 a friend read an old screenplay of mine that had never been made into anything uh, and uh, thought it was good work and thought they could convince uh, some editors in comic books to give me a tryout and uh, Dynamite Gave me a five issue series called uh, Legendary Vampirella. Uh, and I was 49 years old at the time. And I seriously recommend a completely new career dropping into your life when you're 49 because the. I had studied film since King Kong at age of five and six. I was interested in how movies were made and cameras and acting and editing. I was an editor, professional editor for 25 years and uh, had read comic books my whole life without the slightest interest in how they were made or attention to process. And when I got that job, I literally went to my bookshelf and went, Watchmen is nine panel grids, crazy. New Frontier is three panel cinemascope frames every page with the occasional break for fascinating and having to learn basically a new artistic language uh, at that age was really something. And like I said, I recommend it highly. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that it started out being, you know, 10% of my work and slowly became 95% of my work. I'm still doing a little development work. Um, there's another irony to the fact that I couldn't get arrested as a screenwriter for a million years in and out of the studio system, trying to get anything off the ground. And, uh, the best jobs I've ever gotten in screenwriting were from being a comic book writer. Like it, about two years ago, um, I heard through the grapevine and an old friend of mine was looking for comic book people to develop a project, uh, and I, uh, I was able to guess before the meeting what the project was, and it turned out to be Red Sonia. And uh, as a Dynamite writer, I was pretty up on Red Sonia, so they hired me, and I did development work on Red Sonia. And it was just that classic thing of driving onto the Paramount lot every day and going, I couldn't get this when I was trying to be a filmmaker. <laughs> you know, like, when I was trying for years to get through these gates, no one would let me through these gates. I write a couple of, you know... Uh, comic books for Dynamite, and now I'm an expert on something. Not my my 30 years of indie filmmaking. Fuck that. That's garbage. <laughs> nobody nobody cares about that. But you know, you write a few comic books. It's just it's it's fascinating how what is interesting to people and what is not interesting pe to people in terms of your relevant experience. I always feel like they they hire guys who can direct commercials with a 10 million dollar budget for 30 seconds thinking that's a good thing to bring into feature filmmaking or television, as opposed to someone who made a 90 minute feature for $20,000. It's like, that's someone who knows how to use money. <laughs> you know? But anyway, all, all of that to say, I'm very happy to have the, uh, the, the comics and beyond every other consideration, it's such, it is so comparatively free of, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Interference, uh, particularly working for a, a smaller publisher who sort of doesn't have the time to screw with me too much editorially uh, is very, very, very nice. <laughs> you know, it's uh, I just pulled I just off pulled the, off the shelf, shelf um, um, 
Ooh, I'm getting a big uh, echo on your end, I think. Oh. Um, my uh, my copy of uh, All I Need to Know About Filmmaking I Learned from the Toxic Avenger uh, by Lloyd Kaufman <laughs> and, J and, and James Gunn, uh, oddly enough, but uh, that I got signed by Lloyd uh, back in 1999 when I met him because he was... Um, I asked you how much he offered you for your film because uh, I had a friend who went to NYU and made this kind of feature over the summer. It was a feature length film that was, you know, another kind of like slashery sort of thing. But um, uh, Lloyd, uh, Lloyd offered him $3,000 for it in 1999. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I I don't think they ever consummated that relationship. But, that, sounds, uh, that sounds about right. That's a that's yeah. a. I remember when the when the when the streamers started. We were talking about that when video on the web became a, uh, started to become a thing. I went to some thing at the L.A. Independent Film Festival, where Digital Entertainment Digital Entertainment Network was there, Atom mm -hmm. Films, all these companies that no longer exist and folded under incredibly sad and uh in some ways litigious circumstances and they were talking about like we pay filmmakers a hundred dollars for their short film I'm like, <laughs> really and they're like yeah it's a pipeline to the industry it's like are there suddenly going to be more directing jobs in the industry or are you just giving a lot of people false hope i'm just curious <laughs> but you know as it turns out you know the the pipeline has expanded as we all you know, no, with the streamers and everything now, but it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's it's been fascinating watching filmmaking uh, evolve over all of this time, and watching, you know, the comic books evolve over all this time, and the you know, the increasing uh, niche marketing of comic books, you know, though that's a completely other topic. I was watching Marvel Six One Six last night. So it was interesting sort of engaging with the history of it. Um, you know, did you guys read comics when you were kids? Chris, did you read comics? Yeah, I did. I, I, um, I have uh, the first comic my dad ever bought me um, was Marvel Tales featuring Spider-Man. I forgot the issue, 89. I have it over there uh, in my comic book collection. But um, we went on a camping trip in Tyler, Texas. And... Um, on the way back, I think we stopped at a little like convenience store place, you know, and it, and I was looking at the comic books cause he was buying who knows what, like beef jerky and pumpkin seeds or something. <laughs> and, and I, and he, 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 I didn't even ask. He just came over. He's like, you want to get a comic book? And I was like, sure. And I, I have it. I have it still. Um, and I remember I read that, that single issue over and over and over again. And then as I got a little older into middle school, I really started to read a lot, and that's when I had my first pull list at a place in in um, in where I grew up in North Texas. It was called Big Bob's Cards and Comics. Uh, that's where my pull list was. That's where I experienced Bone and Spawn and uh, the Mask and all of these things that were coming out, like the Dark Horse Star Wars comic books, the Clone Saga for Spider Man. Um, I was reading all of that stuff, I, and then I was briefly did the subscription thing. I think with Marvel, when you could do that, they'd mail it to your house. Yeah, right. I did that for quite a while, but several in, I would have issues like ripped in half. Oh, really? Show up. Yeah. <laughs> it was, I, it was I, quite I, terrible. I got my, the, I associate the mail, the mail order one with like the introduction of cardiac, that character who I put in, I put in Iron Man issue three because it made such a weird, indelible impact. I was like, who's this character? Like <laughs> the angry doctor who took out his own heart. Like, cause he's so mad. I was like, <laughs> what and yeah it was like kind of the ponderous era of comic books and then you know then i would get wizard magazine too and i would you know, pour over that in the back seat multiple times while you know on, on weekend drives my parents like to go drive around and look at houses this was like a thing they like to do in texas we'd drive way out in the middle of nowhere and they'd look at these house listings they liked to imagine living in different houses we like only moved twice while i was a kid but <laughs> um, and so i would just i'd get a, a I'd read Wizard and then over and over again. And then at some point during the day, we would get a Slurpee. And that meant we were kind of like wrapping it up. <laughs> and so I'd have Slurpee and Wizard Magazine. And uh, and yeah, and then I, you know, those subscriptions um, in my pull box were, were huge just for me. I was an only child as well. So it was a, a lot of action figures, a lot of alone time in my head. And, um, you know, I had some problems actually, you know, in that regard, um, just in terms of 
you know, obsessive ruminations and things like this that didn't get diagnosed until I was in my 30s. But comics allowed me to gravitate towards story and then also detail, right? So my brain could, there's endless detail in comic book worlds, especially in the big two titles, right? It's, what is the mythology of, you know, and I, I have the Marvel handbook on my, my desk right here, you know? So it's like, you can just endlessly and I get excited even now where it's like, oh, I need to know, did, can Stiltman fire anything? I need an answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's, it's like, what, what's the answer here? And and um, my brain feasts on that kind of thing. So sure. it's a very neutral thing to obsess about. And so it, it really helped me through middle school, through some rough times. And, um, I mean, you know, and then I didn't, I picked it up back again in, in college. I, I moved out to LA to SC, you know, that, the giant city. I wasn't in Texas anymore. And I started going to, I started taking weekend drives once I got a car to Golden Apple on Melrose, one of their original bigger locations. Yeah. And what I figured out actually is it was around the same time that I think Jerry Duggan was working there, which is amazing. So I probably oh, wow. would walk in and I'd be an 18 year old and, and he'd be behind the counter at some point. But, you know, then I started going into back issues of Ant-Man and, you know, black costume Spider-Man and just like digging through things, but then also discovering like, that that's when like Grant Morrison's new X-Men was coming out. You know, it was like, and all the ultimates and all that stuff it was like, oh, they're trying, they're trying to figure some stuff out here. Cause clearly the business was <laughs> in a weird place in the early 2000s. And that led me to an internship at, at Marvel Studios when I was 19 in 2001. Oh, wow. And I, it was one little room <laughs> or one little floor, fourth floor of a, nondescript building on, on Santa Monica Boulevard in Century City. And the people in the office were the receptionist, Avi Arad, um, who had, they just done X-Men 1. Yeah. Um, there was a, uh, there was an office for the comic books, like one of the head of comic books folks. I don't think it was Perlmutter, but it was like whoever, it was somebody who was never there. They were in New York. Kevin Feige, who was 29, and had just rolled off as an associate producer on X-Men. And then Chris Yost was the head of like R and D and development. And Chris obviously went on to write his own books and I was running Cowboy Bebop and, you know, he worked on Thor, the Thor films and me. And then there was a kite company that they owned called Spectra Star because this was when Marvel was <laughs> because Marvel was in such trouble. They sold part of their company to Toy Biz and Toy Biz also owned Spectra Star, which was a kite company. So they split the office floor between us and the kite guys and the kite guys were like Glen Gary, Glenn Ross selling kites. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Like shirts and ties. Did they ever, did they ever come over? They were like, Chris, we need you to fold some kites. They were in cubicles. And they're just like, like I got, I got Walmart up at a hundred thousand units on the, uh, the daredevil. Kite. You know, like it was like, Wow. Put him on Put the ball of string. Put him on the board. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think you have your next AMC series here. Yeah, Chris, really. right? Always be kiting. But I had to yeah. walk through their through their office to get to our comic book vault, which was pretty cool and substantial. But I had to always pass the the Glen Gary Glen wow. Rob, you know, like. <laughs> I want to I want to talk about you talked about the very beginning, like you picked up some of the comics at convenience stores because that was my yeah, first and as well, like. Too. My first two comic books were Batman 466, which I picked up at Walmart when yeah. our our local Walmart sold comic books. And then I got the Death of Superman trade. Which you still have. Which I still have at a gas station. When, uh, the, when the building next to ours was on fire and we thought all of our belongings <laughs> were going to be gone and Jason was still at Emerald City and I was here. I said, what comics do you want? And the only oh. thing he wanted was Death of I Superman. I said, grab Death of Superman. Um, <laughs> nice. But... You know, but that it was it was you know Seven Eleven, Tar like yeah, like because Walmart uh, where, where I lived, there were no comic book shops at all. So yeah. I, there was one or two I knew, but like that was a special trip, and that and that's partly what led me to like kind of get out of comic books because once Walmart took them away in yeah. the late in the late nineties, I was kind of like, well, I I can't buy comic books, and, and that's what led me to like subscribing at Marvel. And then I stopped doing that because again, all my issues kept getting like- Yeah, they would get like beat to shit. Beat like, to hell. Um, I gotta show you. But, <laughs> but Death of Superman was like the first time that I realized that like all these characters lived in the same universe. I thought Batman and Wonder Woman and all those characters were in different universes. And then when they all showed up to Superman's funeral, funeral I was like- <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> 
Somebody did point out to me once, though, that the difference, one of the biggest differences between the Marvel Universe and the DC Universe is the DC Universe was discrete characters with their own universes for many, many years mm -hmm. before World's <laughs> Finest, before, you know, there are no Batman, Superman crossovers in the 1930s or the 1940s. It's not, they aren't doing that. And I think that's partially why you get the, how ridiculously poorly DC has handled filmed versions of its stories since the dawn of filmed versions of its stories. The idea that no one in 1989 went, you know what, Chris Reeve having a two minute cameo in Batman would be so awesome and fun and funny. Like that didn't occur to anybody. That, no, when I, when Linda, Carter, let's put Linda Carter and Chris Reeve in one shot in this movie and everybody will lose their fucking minds and we could launch a whole thing. But because they've always kind of lived in these enclosed structures, mm -hmm. whereas the Marvel Universe was always Doctor Strange lives down the street from the Spider-Man shows up yeah, in a in Fantastic Four issue. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I was an intern at the studio, like that, that was that was it was assumed that that would never happen. The crossover stuff. It was assumed that like, like they had a damage control project in development that everybody loved, but it's like, well, we'll never be able to put the actual superheroes in it. And now you're like, I think they're making that show. I think like yeah. Disney Plus is making that yeah. show. Here, I was going to show you uh, 7-Eleven, Night Thrasher number one. That's nice. amazing. Where I came from. Uh, Tom Thumb Grocery Store. Nice. Uh, in Texas. Incredible. And then Walmart, the Walmart version of this. Nice. And then this was this is my first book. This is the the one my dad got me when I was we went to the convenience store, which was like, oh, wow. yeah. And they're all newsstand editions. That's a, that's a um, heck of a cover. Yeah, I, I know. Right? It's it, it, it's punching Wolfsbane, which is very funny. It's like that's aggressive, you know. But like, <laughs> Spider, so fucking werewolf. So you know. So, yeah. Um, uh, where I come from, we didn't even have comics at convenience stores. The only place you could get comics if there wasn't a dedicated shop, which. I'm an army brat, so there were no comic book shops on base. The only place that you could get comics was a Canex, which is the Canadian version of a PX on a on a base, like a general store, or um, the grocery store. So my mom's family is francophone, so my first comics were like Asterix and Obelix and Tintin and Babar and like all the French comics of questionable racial relations even in the 90s <laughs> and the early aughts. Uh, unless we went to the big civilian cities, uh, outside, and I remember my dad giving me a toonie, which is a two dollar Canadian coin, and be like, "You can get anything out of the quarter bin that you want, kid." And uh, my first comic was New Teen Titans thirty nine, which is where uh, Dick Grayson and uh, I think it's Roy, maybe it's Wally. I think it's Wally. It's one of the redheads doesn't matter. Dick Grayson was what was important about that. <laughs> are walking away from the white cover with their uniforms draped over the logo because he's not going to be Robin anymore, and Robin was my favorite super because we got Batman the animated series years later than it aired in America. Um, so I loved Robin and I was like, why doesn't he want to be Robin anymore? How could this be a thing? <laughs> Robin's the best job in the world. And I, I still have that issue on our rack in the next room as well. And then Teen Titans remains my favorite super team of all time uh, for that reason. <laughs> well, I, I think my first comic, I'm, I'm definitely the oldest one here and I, there was a there was a thing that existed uh, that kind of no longer exists called a candy store, which was a combination <laughs> of like a diner and a 7-Eleven. And sometimes there was even a pharmacy in there. It was like an all purpose. Imagine a like a Rite Aid with a functioning diner and a comic book store and a magazine store in it. That was sort of what it was. And that was generally where you picked up your comic books and the 7-Eleven. And specialty stores actually sort of come along in my lifetime. There were no comic book stores in the 70s. That's a that's a direct market thing in the mm. 80s. And I'm pretty sure my first comic was a... My dad was a World War II veteran, and I was fascinated by that. And I think he bought me a Sergeant Fury. Uh, I can't remember what issue. And I had an Iron... I had a Tales of Suspense back when that was Iron Man and Captain America together i think it's number 68 i think that's the oldest comic i own and i remember buying star wars number four <laughs> in the candy store before i had seen the movie nice oh wow so i, so I was wow. familiar with everything from 
the detention block to the TIE fighter attack. I was I had read that 300 times before I actually saw the movie. I didn't oh, know anything so that happened. Be- <laughs> I had no idea what happened before or after. But like when they rescue Princess Leia, I was like, OK, I can coast for 10 minutes. I know it's I know what's going on here. Um, when I was again, seven, I okay. bought I when I was seven, I <laughs> got I bought the novelization of Tim Burton's Batman, or I got my parents for me at the. I did that for Batman Circle. Returns. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I got that same one at the movie theater. Yeah, I had not yeah. seen the movie yet, and I was like, "I'm gonna read this," and it's like, mm. and so we got to like some of the parts. I was like, "Oh yeah, that's where he melts that guy's face." You know, like it was. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait for this one, mom. You know, like I, I was, I just had to have that. You know, I was thick, like mass market. Novel. I did something like that for. Um, when they did um, those novelizations, I think they were written by Roger Stern for Nightfall and the Death and Return of Superman yeah. because I could only get that trade paperback of Death of Superman and I was like, well, I know he comes back. How does this happen? And then I saw the novel and I bought the novel and that's how I figured out what happened. Yeah. My, uh, my first job in the United States was, other than a KY Jelly commercial that I think only aired in France, uh, was nice. at a. It's very covered up. I assure you, my mm. mom is very proud of my career. Um, but it won but, the Palme d'Or, that, and that's the important. Yes, thing. that's what matters. <laughs> because no one here speaks French. Everyone speaks French. Yeah. Uh, was was I worked at a comic book store, and that's where I met Jason mm-hmm. on Free Comic well, Book Day. <laughs> so my 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 first uh, foray into comics, a comic book shop. Uh, my mom went bowling on uh, Wednesdays, and um, so I would go with her. Uh, and she, you know, give me a handful of quarters and I would go and play the, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, video game or Operation Wolf or whatever. Um, inside the bowling alley was a pro shop that had this sort of annex and, um, and there was basically something different in that annex, like every couple of months, like somebody would come in try to set something up, fail miserably. Um, I remember they sold like, uh, you know, darts at one point like the <laughs> soft tip dart machines had just gone uh, come into bars and become a big thing and so they tried to do that and you know um sometimes it would be like sports memorabilia or or whatever but always failed miserably and so for a for a period of time a guy opened up a comic shop in there and you know all of us kid all, all of us video game kids wandered in and we're just kind of fascinated by all this stuff it was the first time we'd ever kind of spent any time with it and um and, you know, the guy tried really hard to, to sell us on stuff. And it's like, hey, you know, uh, uh, Superman's doing this and Batman's doing this and Daredevil's doing this. And, you know, we didn't care too much at that point. But how he hooked me, um, and I have the actual issues in the garage. I wish I had them now. But um, was he gave me the first issue of something called uh, Reed Fleming, the world's toughest milkman. <laughs> have you guys ever read it? No. Uh, I was it's a big fan in the 80s, actually. It's a very funny yeah. comic. It's, I mean, it is just incredible. And it's, it, it, Reed Fleming is this Bukowski-esque figure, just this like drunken milkman who, uh, you know, he drives around in his milk truck drinking rye, rye whiskey. And I believe on the first page, he's, you know, he's drinking rye whiskey in his truck, uh, uh, trying to do his route. He's careening through the streets, narrowly missing this person and that person, sideswiping mailboxes. And then he rolls up onto an old lady's lawn, uh, uh, you know, completely tears up the lawn, stumbles up, uh, uh, is trying to deliver her milk. She, uh, she complains about it being late. He opens up the milk bottle, pours it on the ground, and then and then pulls her close and says, "37 cents, or I piss in your flowers." Um, and that was all it took. I was I was hooked on comics. Yeah. <laughs> love at <laughs> first sight. Yeah, yeah, love at first sight. I, I I was hooked on it. I'm like, oh my god, I've ne- this is this is insane, uh, uh, but wonderful. I've never seen anything like that. And then. You know, you read through it and it just gets crazier and crazier. But um, but like Jason, uh, uh, you know, I guess I fell um, I fell in love with traditional comics. I was one of the guys who got pulled in by the death of Superman. That was when I first kind of got pulled into a comic shop and ended up with my pull list and the whole the whole nine yards. Um, and uh, you know, right around that time, the image revolution was happening. You know, and and, and you had a lot of that stuff. What really ended up, uh, you know, kind of hooking me was uh, when Vertigo really took flight and. You know, it was uh, it was Hellblazer and Preacher and and you know Transmet and and, and books like that. Uh, Bone ended up being a big one. Um, uh, you know, just just seeing the kind. You know, again, because I, I I mean I came up in I came up in the Sundance era and I sort of fell in love with those sort of left of center stories. You know, um, and 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 seeing people just I mean, I did a lot of diving through 
the back bins, you know, when I, when I first kind of got into a comic shop and, 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 uh, you know, and, and Marvel's greatest hits, DC's greatest hits. And, and you could find stuff like that, you know, again, like, in, uh, you know, Marvel made Tony Stark an alcoholic in the seventies, you know, I mean, that was like, that, that blew my fucking mind. Like, Oh my God, you can tell this kind of story in here. Um, but too often those, you know, those superhero books, they, they walked a straight line and those stories were very similar. It's, uh, it's, um, you know, bad guy of the week who, um, you know, uh, uh, got superpowers because of some horrible accident. And, uh, you know, let's just change the variables the same, uh, Although you know, the, same the, the seventies and eighties, like the, the bronze age stuff into like what I guess they're calling the copper age now stuff is, yeah. is pretty copper. Phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, it will. Uh, whatever. But like those, yeah. the, the 1984, like through the like the the early to to late 80s, even in the early 90s, like some of the stuff they did, where like Spider Man accidentally kills a random woman, you know, or it's just yeah. like holy yeah. shit, or like hey, you know the blog Wolverine has? He kills people people with them. Where they finally acknowledge that they're like he kills people with those, like. Or, or just yeah. like some of those things. And in the early nineties where it's like, let's break Batman's back, you know, or, yeah. like, yeah. holy, holy moly. So, I, but I think they were taking cues from those Vertigo books. I think yeah, they were, yeah. I think those writers were inspired by their, like, as the younger people came in, they were like, well, I like this over here. I want to, let's do something else. And I guess, cause those companies were always trying to figure out how to move stuff. They were like, right. let's try it, you know? Well, that's uh, the yeah. I, I was lucky to be reading Swamp Thing already when Alan Moore came in. And I had been reading it since issue one, Len Wein, Bernie Wrightston back in the day. And the thing about genius is then everybody who isn't a genius does an incredibly bad job imitating it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Alan Moore's rewrite of that origin story is an act of absolute brilliance that is not endlessly repeatable. And mm -hmm. so you keep getting people going, uh, okay, so Swamp Thing was never Alec Holland. Uh, Krypton never exploded. Uh, you know, like they just want, it's like, no, you can't apply. Alan Moore had a brilliant, smart idea about that character and he was able to pull it off and completely transform how the character is seen going mm -hmm. forward. You, you gotta have an idea that brilliant to do that. <laughs> and you see a lot of people, that trope of everything you know is wrong is now like the most tired. The, the retcon disease mm -hmm. where it's like, uh, you know, yeah, that's, it can be a little much, but yeah, I like mean, some of the books, yeah. If you have a great take, fantastic, do it, love it. And that's the, you know, like you, you were talking about looking up uh, a character for, was it for your Dr. Doom? comic uh uh Over iron man, man. man. Still yeah still man still man will appear in iron man later <laughs> nice <laughs> the way that it's incredible. yeah but, but you again, know to me that's yeah. the, that's the best use of these giant universes is take a character that no one no one cares about stilt man you know that's who you can do something really wild and interesting like what tom king did with um kite with, man uh, kite man yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly that's it was like Let's let's. What if we made this person a person? You know what I mean. I think yeah. that that is always fun, and I I, I I'm I'm amazed by because after seeing some of the studio stuff, even in the early days, and then working at Disney, how protective they are of, of all these brands. Like the comic book editors, I think because the business is so shrunk so much, like are are very much like try it. You know what I mean? Like that they. Yeah. they you know, they're like, do an issue where, where Tony doesn't wear the armor the whole time. You know what I mean? Like, and, and they do have a legacy of that. It's like, here's one where Tony is in a cardboard box in an alley. You know, it's like, well, there's no. an issue of Hawkeye that's all in American Sign Language. And they just trust that you are either smart enough yeah. to figure it out or you will Google it and yeah. you will figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's an incredible issue, by the way. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, and, also, and good sign language. It's all accurate, which is amazing. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> We have, so we have a sign language character in Iron Man and, and Kafu, the artist, you know, he's he's showing key phrases and how we're actually doing it, where it's like the hand is kind of ghosting across the the frame in a way where, and then again, his the character's deafness has nothing to do with his superpower. You know what I mean? We're not mm -hmm. like, look, you know, it's like, it's, <laughs> he has a completely different power, a mutant power that it just has nothing to do with the fact that he's deaf. 
I think That's the great. types of stories that you're speaking to is are why things like uh, Earth One, Black Label, and I think the DC Kids line right now is like some of the most exciting stories yeah. that are being told because it's completely divorced from everything else. It's carte blanche. You're introducing it to a new character like uh, Diana, Princess of Themyscira is outstanding. The Beast Boy and Raven uh, yeah. are so good. The new Green Lantern. And, and I think sometimes that gets lost in the fray with these companies that have been around for like uh, almost a hundred years at this point. And it's, yeah. and it's like that battle of protecting IP, which as a bunch of people who've worked independently, you don't have the burden of that. You're like, I'm just gonna do whatever I want because she yeah, ran yeah. new. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, and, yeah. It's, and it's ultimately not being crazy protective of the IP because the thing is with retcons and everything, there are already 10,000 contradictory Superman stories. Someone writing another Superman story that doesn't jive with every single thing that's ever happened to Superman in his history is fine, <laughs> you know? Because only it's Grant like, Morrison is capable of encompassing it all and making it all matter. Well, I, <laughs> and speaking of that too, like since uh, I love that a lot of us are the convenience store comic book kids <laughs> because one of my big frustrations was I would read like a series like Iron Man or I would read like a series like Nightwing and I could get like issue eight and I would be, it would be a miracle if I got issue nine. Most yeah. of the time, it, it would be like issue hard. 14. Yeah. And I would just have to fill in the gaps and of like, no, what happened? There's not a good enough internet source yet <laughs> no. to be able to be like, I can just yeah. read. So I've, I, I've always said for years, I've always preached like you, everybody, especially comic book fans, you always make your own continuity because like it's the yeah. only way you can make it work. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I even miss issues sometimes now, right? Where like I try to yeah. keep on certain things to be like, wait, I'll get through an issue and be like, I never read number two, you know? And then I go back and check it and be like, oh, okay, I see how they got to this. Yeah. Well, like it, and that, that's and good. Yeah. Ultimately, if the writing is good, like I haven't been paying attention to DC's main Superman continuity pretty much ever. And I decided to pick up <laughs> Lois Lane. You're talking uh, to the ben, wrong dude right now. <laughs> I, I, decided to, I decided to pick up Bendis's Lois Lane. Right, because uh, I like him. He's a good, you know, or was it Rucka? Now I'm, I mean, it was, it was Rucka, Rucka. Yeah, yeah, it was Rucka. Uh, and so, like, oh, they're, oh, they have a kid. Oh, okay. Like there was John so Ken much... is so excellent, though. Cannot recommend <laughs> checking out more John Kent stories. Oh yeah, <laughs> no, it, it was. You know, it was one of those things where I was like, oh, huh, how about that? And there's a yeah. part I used to say this about the many Star Trek spinoffs when it when Deep Space Nine and Voyager were both on the air. I was like. There's a degree to which watching an episode randomly is like picking up your hometown newspaper. Yeah. When you've been at it, it's like, oh, we're, 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 with, we're at war with the Kardashians now, huh? with the Kardashians now. How about that? Oh, Worf, Worf and Jazzy are, mad, are dating. That's nice. You know, just like, <laughs> just like getting the like, yeah. oh, you know, that's what's happening with my, oh, Lois and Clark are together now. How nice for them. You know, it's yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it has a certain, I think comics for me, like comics have a certain procedural element that sometimes gets lost in TV storytelling because now TV is so hyper serialized. You know, I'm still waiting for some show to feel a little bit more like. That's what you, you can know, say. Buffy the Vampire Slayer or something <laughs> like that, where like there's an ongoing story, but like right now they're fighting a mummy they found in their museum. Yeah. You know what I mean? Do you watch like, Doctor Who? Like, Come for the mummy story, stay for the end of the world story. To, like To a certain degree, The Mandalorian is doing that. Like there's an overarching yeah. thing, but there's like a mini mission. But they've got to copy one different concluded. Western movie every week because nobody's yeah. ever seen them. <laughs> yeah. But no, yeah, it's, I, 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 I've been saying that for a while. Like I actually do think because like we've become so heavily serialized to where it's like chapters of a novel that like, I, I do think like we're gonna pivot back a little bit more to like the single issue comic books. Even single issue comic books, it was like this idea, and I, I hope I want television to steal this. The idea that like yeah. yeah, there is the mission of the week, but there is that yeah, like that Buffy the Vampire Slayer. We're leading towards the big bad, so every issue like well, moves yeah. you a little bit closer to it. I think Doctor Who well, I mean, does that though, yeah, yeah. because you've got to have your Dalek do episode, yeah, I, I, you've got to have I, your yeah. Cyberman episode. But I yeah. mean, that's not American television, so maybe that's sort of out of the sphere yeah. of the conversation. I will say though that we're we're all ignoring. The the world is full of hour long network drama. Yeah, that's, yeah, fair. Yeah, that's fair. Like everything, yeah, 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 everything on case. CBS. Yeah, is, <laughs> is, is, is CSI like serialized in any degree? Yeah, it's like it. Which is fine, but there. 
I, my wife and I have been talking about this, like during the pandemic, there has been, for us at least, like I cannot sit down at the end of the day, whatever's going on in our lives, plus the world and watch Perry Mason, as good as it is. It's like, I can't do like this, I can't do like an actor who I love with a showrunner who I love being written by a, a staff of writers who are incredible, doing amazing work. It's so dark and so like the drama is so wrenching yeah. that like I we we the every night now what we do like because we've already worked through Buffy the Vampire Slayers we do Star Trek Discovery and then we watch an Angel episode. It's, <laughs> such, a, it's such a nice like we can you know Discovery we still I mean I know I hate when people do this to my shows but it's like we can talk through it like we can mm -hmm. comment on it like angel like we can then we can then we can really let loose like it's like you know but it's fun. You're, you're invested enough and you're like i like that person i but it it's it's a salve for some it's 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 escapism in a way that is um actually helpful and therapeutic mm -hmm. you know what I mean? and i find that like i just i wrote that one shot um fantastic four issue that came out on wednesday and and doing one shot stories is our it's really rewarding when you can pull it off. And like my Iron Man arc, because I was like really trying to swing for the fences, it's like, it might end up being 15 to 20 issues of this, this single arc. And it's like, God, but it, it does feel novelistic in that way. And there's something great about that. But I'm trying to break it up into chapters where it's like, well, I can pick up this one issue that's just about Hellcat and going back to high school or whatever it is, you know, like that, it's such a delicate balance and i think comics are doing it more and i think tv will a more cable tv and streaming tv will about to do it even more um just there, there has yet to be that kind of like prestige television procedural show mm -hmm. you know there's anthologies like twilight zone or black mirror things like this the Phil electric dreams but like i we tried to do one that actually didn't go last year it was kind of semi-procedural and it was about a um, addiction facility, like a, re a rehab center, like uh, way far away on like an, in Hawaii, you know, like place you go fly to and stay and like recuperate from your life. Um, kind of like half SLN, half, you know, like addiction and treatment. And, and we would, our writers, we would have trouble because you try to break a single story and make up a new character for it, you know, episode six and you have a lot of people in the room who have done been working since you know the wire and the sopranos and Mad Men, and they're going why the fuck do i care about such and such and who are we going to get for that we're going to pay them double top of show and like like it how does that affect the bigger story it's hard it's hard to actually like i found it hard to like get the gears moving on a story that if it doesn't feel like it has weight over multiple episodes um it won't it won't move forward you know it doesn't feel load bearing to do a patient of the week you know it, mm -hmm. so you can do it you watch those old shows and you go man yeah, that house. was a sort of er yeah. right we're like yeah and, house and is a Sherlockian pastiche though so like the engine is oh. a little different yeah i think that a regular medical drama i was i was so embarrassed for myself that it took me until the first episode of the second season to realize it was sherlock holmes his when I saw that his was called Irene Adler. When I saw that his, <laughs> when I saw that his apartment was twenty two twenty one B, I was like, "No, oh, Jesus, Holmes is not a, a house is a home." I mean, come on, Jesus, Wilson, that's not Watson. even very thoughtful. Like that's they didn't work very hard to come up with. What can we call him that's like Holmes? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a huge Sherlock person. Oh, so if we're gonna sure. go yeah. down that, I'm sorry that I don't. But know. no, but that is but but those are procedurals and they do have beginning, yes, middle, yeah. and end. That's you know, that's interesting that. you bring that up, Chris, too, about the whole idea of this. Like, like it was hard to get modern writers to get their gears around that because it's impossible. It's, it's so I, funny yeah. when I think about those old shows, even the procedurals, like the episodes that always stand out to me, even like things of Star Trek are always like the one off shows. Like the episode of ER that stands out to me is that one where it's like George Clooney driving down the road and he finds the kid stuck in the grate. And the whole episode is George Clooney can't get this kid out of the grate. Or in yeah. CSI where Nick is buried in the yeah. box, like yeah. that two-parter. Yeah, there's the, and or, then or the that. Or Dinofrio under, under the subway car in Homicide Life in this movie. Yeah, that yeah. Was yeah. An amazing episode. Bring yeah, back the, the model episode with the fly. Like, yeah. There's so many of them, and, and X Files like 
you know, my wife and I are big X-Files people, but it, so it's like, but it's the monster of the week episodes where you go like, yes, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, no, those are, those are definitely an unhealthy snack and I'm going to make some jokes and we're going to have fun. You know, it doesn't have to yeah. be like, smoking if you love X-Files and you haven't, older. haven't seen the latest season of the crown yet. You must. Oh yeah. Uh, yes. That is, <laughs> that is great. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a I love that performance, the Thatcher performance so much. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, you know, it's funny. The, you talk, it, it's it's so interesting. You brought up the crown. The crown is re weirdly almost procedural. Like where every issue, every episode is sort of about the thing that Thatcher is doing. Yeah, or there's Charles a and Diane. or one yeah. or one character, right? Like Moon does. Yeah, it's usually about like one thing because the next episode usually jumps ahead years in time. Yeah, yeah, and I I, I I've been finding that in comic books, it's been to 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 gravitate towards that story. It feels. It feels more satisfying to do that in a kind of episodic nature because there are books that I love where it's like they go from point A to point B where it's like, remember what happened? And it's like, oh, shit, now this is going to happen next month. And it's like, why? Well, I just I want a little bit more of, of, right. of something in there that that I can just pick up and go. It's a modular yeah. story nested within a bigger one, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. Adventure that's Continues cool. might be the only thing that's really doing that right now, and that's because it's based on the 90s animated series, which was just one-offs, and we just throw continuity to the wind. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do feel like uh, television and... Uh, in television in particular, I think you can spot a dog paddle episode really fast. And oh, yeah, where you're just like... I, look, with great love and respect for Angel. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Angel has a lot of those where it's what we would call them in a writer's room, what my mentor John Lisko calls those episodes or those scenes or sequences is an FTD, which is a fucking tap dance <laughs> where you've got nothing. And you're just like, oh, you know, like uh, 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 Angel can walk out in the sun for a day. You know, okay. <laughs> do it. And it's just it's just like there's a lot of fucking tap dance episodes where you're like waiting. And I to the and I have, to deal with I the have devil. Some... I have some sympathy for that. My wife worked on Chuck as a costumer for a long time, uh, for most of the run. And she said frequently, like, they'd get a nine-episode order, and they'd be filming episode eight with the season finale that they had built to for eight episodes ready. And then they would get four more episodes. And they were like, well, now we have to fuck off for three episodes. <laughs> <laughs> and go, I don't know. Let's give a, you know, like in uh, in Buffy, it's like, let's give a whole episode to, uh, um, who is the kid? The kid that joins them in the last season? Jonathan. One of the trio kids. One of the, uh, tri it was it Jonathan? One of the trio well, kids. The, the one that didn't die. Uh, uh, spoiler alert. Yeah, what, what, well, yeah, what, 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 well, John, I mean, Jonathan gets his own years. episode at some point. I mean, I thought that, that you know. Was great, but it's then a kid from the, Cabin in the Woods, right? The, no. the Fred Kratz? The, the one friend. Who's in Dollhouse? Like, I don't know, maybe. But I don't remember. It's Adam, but like they give him one in the final season. You're like, and he's telling the whole story from the point of, uh, point of view of his camcorder, because he's in the background of all of the like insane "we're about to fight for the end of the world" stuff. Oh, it's like and a lower decks episode. <laughs> gorgeous, because he has this self reflective moment. He has a couple of these self reflective moments of like, he realizes his place in it is that he will probably die, right, because of the hierarchy, mm -hmm. and um. I don't, it's one of those that you end up remembering that episode, you know, mm -hmm. more than right. You know, some of them, or like you know, the Xander bottle episode, where you're like, you know, they're fighting, the, they're fighting the demons in the background, and he's like driving around the city trying to get away from two zombie people from high school who used to beat him up, you know, like <laughs> it's like that kind of thing is is fascinating to me. I think like I I have fantasies of if I get to stay on the book long enough for Iron Man, like after finishing some crazy arc, doing like a couple issues that are like, um, you know, Iron Man just hangs out for a second and like, that would be a good that. issue for Rhodey to show up in. Well, <laughs> Rhodey, Rhodey's coming this month. So I just wanted to tell you that, that Rhodey. I, I, it's about time, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> War Machine wow. is a little, he's Spit a little fire. Rhodey, but, Rhodey Rhodey. This month, but, uh, but no, like I was, I was at the dentist. I was at the dentist a couple days ago and I was like, you know when they the hygienist leaves the room to take the x-rays of your teeth? Mm -hmm. They have to punch, punch the button. I was like, man, there could be just such a great one-issue story where there was a hygienist who never left the room hitting that button. 
And so at a certain point, like that, that, that dental hygienist got super disturbed and like maybe super powered by the amount of radiation they've absorbed over their career from just hitting that button over and over and nice. over again and never leaving the room. And then just making that a one, a one-off issue where Iron Man fights a hygienist who calls themselves toothache, you know, or something oh, like wow. you do that issue. That actually, a, that, everybody that, just still open a beer. We're doing toothache this month. Then we're going right. to get to Tony soul next week. Like, just, just, I'm going to start preparing your 2021 Eisner. <laughs> that actually, that, that that like kind of Iron thing. Man versus toothache. That sounds like the kind of thing uh, music would do in a one-off uh, after a city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, that's so you know. funny because you brought that up, and as Chris was pitching that, I kept thinking about the transgender issue of Astro City for some reason mm -hmm. that he won yeah. the Eisner for. I was like, oh, yeah. yeah. I will. One last thing on television that just the the ultimate expression of the jokes about what TV shows have to be to get on the air is that Snowpiercer became a procedural about a police detective investigating a murder <laughs> like yeah. that movie they yeah, were I, I, say this, I say this often about Halt and Catch Fire. if we had pitched the version of halt and catch fire that the show became that people really loved and that we started to love to write we wouldn't have sold it yeah and i'm not trying to be mean to amc it's just like there's no way we could have sold that version of the show like yeah. I, I just don't see how you pitch that and i'm going but what what is it you know like <laughs> <laughs> But I guess to me, that's the, the funniest thing in the world is that you take Snowpiercer and go, so it's about a cop. <laughs> like, yeah, incredible. All right, sure, so sure, sure, sure. <laughs> that's what that story right, I, about. It, yes. On that note, I know that uh, I know that Chris uh, has to get out for a meeting. I uh, hate to wrap it up because it's a great conversation, but uh, why don't we just go around the uh, the, the wheel here? Uh, we'll start with Ashley and then, uh, and then move on across. Uh, just tell us where we can find you, what you're up to, and, and all that good stuff. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley V Robinson. The V is very important. Ashley Robinson is a WNBA player. I don't want to fight for SEO. I'm sure she's lovely, but she's <laughs> tall. Uh, you can subscribe to my podcast with Jason called Geek History Lesson at Geek History Lesson. Everywhere fine podcasts are found. Um, one of Chris's panels with Jason is up there. I'm sure we'll get around to everybody else on this panel being guests because we have 350 <laughs> episodes and we're not stopping anytime soon. Nice. And Jupiter Jet in the Forgotten Radio Volume 2 of our Eisner-nominated uh, all-ages adventure series Jupiter Jet is on sale now where all fine comic books are found. Uh, please pick it up. And if you work for a streaming service, please contact our reps. We would love to adapt it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you can find me on Twitter and everywhere where it's important at Jawin. That's J-A-W-I-I-N. And, and again, Jupiter Jet and the Forgotten Radio is on Amazon. Go check it out. Uh, you can find me um, um, on Twitter at, at if you can't well, spell my last name, like C-A-N-T-W-E-L-L. -L. Um, I talk about stuff there. Um, you know, Iron Man is once a month. Number four comes out uh, on the 16th. Uh, the end of Doctor Doom, the last issue of Doctor Doom, number 10, comes out on the 23rd of December. And then you get a little coda of Doctor Doom and Iron Man fighting evil Santa on December 30th for the King in Black crossover. Nice. Um, that's a very fun one. Um, I'll have a couple more Burger Books graphic novels coming out uh, in the next, in, in 2021. And eventually there will be a Paper Girls television series and I'll be dead by then when you see it because it's so hard to make, but enjoy it. Love you all. Can't wait for that. Uh, I'm davidavalonefreelance.com. Uh, there are no WNBA players with my name, thank God. So it's, it's very easy. Yet. That, na that name that I was endlessly teased for as a kid actually turns out to be really good in the age of Google because nobody has it. Um, and... Uh, don't have anything new coming out in floppies, but uh, my second volume of Alvira, Mistress of the Dark, just came out. Uh, first volume of Betty Page Unbound, as I like to call it, The Crisis on Infinite Bettys, uh, I think came out last month. And uh, Elvira, The Omega Ma'am, just wrapped up on uh, Kickstarter, and that'll probably be solicited in the next few months. Riley. Mm -hmm. I am at Ryland Grant, uh, R-Y-L-E-N-D-G-R-A-N-T. Uh, I always spell it because it's not a real name. My parents drunkenly uh, arranged letters and settled me with it. So uh, uh, at Ryland Grant on all forms of social media, uh, 
uh, the uh, Ringo Award winning uh, Aberrants and the Ringo nominated uh, band jacks are available in fine comic shops everywhere and on Amazon and Comixology and, uh, and, and all that stuff. Um, uh, the Jump and the Peacekeepers are available via Backer Kit uh, right now. Um, uh, soon to be available in comic shops uh, once all this COVID nonsense uh, sorts out. But right now you can get it at the Peacekeepers, uh, one word, dot backer kit, dot com. Uh, and that's a pretty cool store. You can get signed copies of all my stuff there um, and some rare con variants that are kind of available nowhere else. Uh, so um, that's uh, that's all my business. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us. It was a hell of a conversation. Yeah, thanks, we should do it again really sometime. Thank yeah, you. Uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching, guys. Take care, everybody. If you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to smash that like button. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or other fine purveyors of ear crack, please leave us a five-star review. And wherever you're watching and or listening, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. We'll see you back here next week for more Madcap Hijinks on the Writer's Block.